All right, welcome back to my video series on solving the mystery of dualism. Uh, once again, the material that I'll be covering in this uh, fourth video is from my book, uh, Evolving Towards the Truth, A Guide for Searchers. Uh, the book is actually a, a series of three meditations, uh, meditations on God, the soul, and enlightenment. And the uh, material covered in this uh, video series is actually from the uh, second meditation on the soul. You can find links to my book uh, at my website, jeffkosmoski.com, and you can find links to my website on my uh, YouTube page. So as you might recall, we're basically on a journey. We're um, following in the footsteps that the human mind typically takes as it tries to solve this mystery of dualism. Um, I've been talking about these two epistemological hurdles that have uh, typically prevented man from making progress um, on, on this mystery. Um, we've covered the first hurdle um, in the uh, previous uh, videos, and this was a uh, hurdle that we encountered on the uh, physical side of the chasm of dualism, um, essentially having to do with how the human mind prefers to view um, this neurophysical activity. And we uh, contended that it was not physical, but it was of an electromagnetic nature. Um, we're now going to hop over to the other side of the chasm and uh, attempt to encounter this second epistemological hurdle. The second epistemological hurdle is really about the self. On a grand scale, it has to do with uh, what the self is, if there is a self, and um, how the mind actually models, or in this case, mismodels itself. On a finer scale, it has to do with the uh, relationship between uh, qualia and the self, or whether experience always requires an experiencer. There are two major uh, pieces of evidence for this uh, confusion about the self. One is the way that uh, people talk about the self, uh, whether we're talking about the um, esteemed experts across the ages, or just the way we refer to the self in our general conversations. Uh, the other piece of evidence is this phenomenon referred to as an infinite regress that uh, philosophers always encounter as they try to solve the mystery of dualism. When I talk about a, a general confusion about the self from a, a historical perspective, uh, we can look at what the Buddha said about the self. Uh, he basically contended that there was no self, that the self is an illusion. And then we can fast forward about 2,000 years to Rene Descartes, who said, I think, therefore I am, uh, basically uh, arguing that there is a self. Um, we can then go about 100 years later to uh, David Hume, a uh, noted uh, Scottish philosopher, who said that he couldn't find this thing called a self, regardless of how hard he tried to look. Um, all he could find is uh, sensations and essentially uh, qualia, but he could find no evidence for this self. And then we can also um, move on to the uh, comments of uh, Sigmund Freud, who said that the self or the mind consists of these three uh, basic divisions, an ego, a superego, and the id. And this uh, confusion about the self is obvious from our uh, everyday uh, conversations. Uh, we hear people say things like, oh, I changed my mind. Um, implying that there's a I part of the self and a mind part, and somehow the I was able to change the thinking of the mind. Uh, we, we hear people say things like, oh, don't mind me, I was just talking to myself. Uh, again, suggesting that there's an I part and a self part, and the I had some information it needed to convey to the self. Uh, we also hear people say, say things like, I'm undecided, part of me wants to stay and part of me wants to go. Uh, again, implying this kind of natural uh, schizophrenia. This uh, second piece of evidence for um, confusion about the self comes from this uh, term of uh, infinite regress that I mentioned. And this comes in uh, two basic flavors. There's a macroscopic and a microscopic uh, version. The uh, macroscopic version of this uh, usually manifests itself when people uh, talk about how the uh, brain makes a mind. Uh, that is, they tend to view the brain as being kind of a front end or a lens uh, through which all of the um, activity or the external phenomena of the real world comes to this metaphysical mind. Um, and then there's this, this vision of a, uh, a little man or a homunculus who sits behind this uh, 
this lens basically and, and views all the activity in the outside world and then makes decisions and works the levers and pushes the buttons that uh, move the, the muscles of the arms and the legs and so forth. And the, uh, the question quickly arises, well, if there's this little man sitting behind the, uh, the brain, um, what's inside of the brain of this uh, little man? Doesn't he uh, have to have a brain and then is there, does that imply the existence of yet another homunculus inside of his brain and then another homunculus inside of the brain of his brain and uh, we have this uh, infinite uh, regress. The uh, second version of the infinite regress is this uh, micro version and this is actually more germane to our immediate task here as we try to answer this question about how does neural activity produce qualia. And we encounter this, uh, this version of the infinite regress by doing the following thought experiment. This thought experiment usually goes something like this. It starts with the idea, let's, uh, let's assume that somebody's uh, smelling some mint leaves and having experience of mint leaves. And let's also assume that this uh, phenomenon is occurring by virtue of electromagnetic activity in this column of reporting neurons. So in our mind's eye, we tend to have this, this uh, image that looks like this. And uh, the first uh, question that occurs is, okay, what happens next? Uh, certainly this electromagnetic activity in itself can't be the uh, end of the story. Um, we need to have some kind of a uh, module or some kind of a process that converts this electromagnetic activity into a, uh, a pure quale. So uh, in the, uh, this thought experiment, we um, invent or we invoke the existence of some kind of a downstream processor or a module, module one, that uh, converts electromagnetic activity into a pure quale. And so now we have this, uh, this uh, imagined pure quale. Okay, fine, so what happens next? We have to invoke the existence of something now that interacts with this quale and experiences the uh, quale. So then in this thought experiment, we uh, freely invoke the existence of some new uh, downstream module, we'll call it uh, module two, that interacts with this quale and by virtue of some interaction um, um, has the experience. And uh, then our next thought is, well, there must be something inside of this uh, module two. It can't just be some kind of a uniform slug of whatever. It needs to have some processing ability. So we um, imagine some type of internal machinery or processing ability of a neurological nature, of course. And uh, we'll make things simple and say that all of the actual real activity is happening by virtue of this uh, submodule D. And so when the quality is experienced, there's activity uh, occurring in submodule D that constitutes our actual first person experience. Okay, that, that seems reasonable, but then we think about um, the submodule D and we go, now wait a minute, this just seems like it's just another isolated activity that needs to be experienced. It also needs some kind of an experiencer, doesn't it? So then we would be inclined to invoke the existence of yet another downstream um, experience or some uh, module three that now exists inside of submodule D that interacts with the activity. And I think you can see where this is going. It's going straight to another dreaded infinite regress. As long as we keep on insisting that experience needs an experiencer, we're going to continue to hit this infinite regress. And this infinite regress is the second epistemological hurdle. My contention is that to get beyond this second hurdle, we need a more enlightened view of the self a view of the self that's enlightened by modern thinking and by the realities of evolution. In the next video, we'll address this more enlightened view of the self. We'll essentially convert this uh, second epistemological hurdle into the uh, necessary support column for our eventual explanatory bridge across the uh, chasm of dualism. I know I covered this material rather quickly, but uh, again, it's uh, covered in greater detail in my book, Evolving Towards the Truth, A Guide for Searchers. I'm Jeff Kosmoski. Thanks for watching.